Today, Jesus is our teacher, wise, powerful, caring, and he gathered his people to gift them with the benefits of wise living in the Sermon on the Mount. We've been following his teaching for a while. Today, he calls us to look up and lift up and aim up to live high, highly by living holy. So that's what we'll talk about tonight. To live holy, yes, live highly. Now, one of the favorite types of messages we have in our church are messages of comfort because everyone has some area of their life that's a train wreck or painful or filled with regret or guilt. And so our primary focus is to take, take a load off Give the gift of peace, of a new beginning, and leave the junk somewhere else to start new. But we also are proud of our people and how God blesses and strengthens and changes you as followers of Christ. And so sometimes we give you a message of courage. We say, you're capable of more. You can do more. There's more blessing, more wisdom, more impact for you. And both of these messages, one is generally a good news gospel message and the other type is usually a directional law message, are found here at Christ the Lord. But today, as we listen to Jesus teach his committed followers, we're primarily going to hear a message of courage. It's a call for you, maybe not to change the world for Christ, but to think about how you can change yourself for Christ to aim higher maybe than you've aimed before or to live higher than you lived before. So it's the theme, live holy, live highly. The Bible reference there from Matthew 5 takes us back to the Sermon on the Mount, which I read uh, a few paragraphs earlier. Some of those phrases are so familiar that I'm going to just quote them and refer to them in today's message, but I bet, I bet they'll ring, uh, you'll, you'll remember them because they're so common. Everything Jesus did, he did not just for his own benefit, but because he cared about people. That was his nature as a shepherd, as a teacher, as a deliverer. And that inspires us too in our Christian hearts. But when we talk about hearts today, that tends to be the seat of emotion, even though in the Bible it is also where your thoughts are. So I want to talk to you today not so much about being in love or feeling romance for another person. I want to talk to you about thinking highly, more highly in your thought life. And since our theme is live holy, live highly, I want you to think of yourself as if you had an airplane heart. That when you make decisions or uh, choose directions or choose words, that you imagine yourself on an ascent you are aspiring to gain altitude and reach a higher place because you don't want to stay where you are on the ground. Jesus has to not only encourage us to do this, but help us to do this because human beings have a different instinct that's part of us by default and it's not an airplane heart that tries to soar to higher virtue, but it's a submarine heart. A submarine is designed to go down, submerge, to the bottom. So I'd like you to think about your thoughts, to think about your actions, and to say, I'm going to have an airplane heart tonight. And the airplane heart's job is to soar higher and higher and higher, always up, as opposed to having a submarine heart whose job is to sink. And sometimes we'll will ascend, other times will struggle. King David was called to do amazing things for the kingdom of God, but in that horrible affair and cover-up and murder, everything went underwater. His sub-heart won the day in 2 Samuel. Your heart, aim high. Live holy, live highly. And those two words, I want you to put them together. So obviously I'm not telling you to build a house that's higher than sea level than your currently house is. But I'm telling you to aim for a greater good that comes in you and out of yourself. Aim for holiness. Now holiness is a deeply important church word. In fact, technically speaking, you you could almost only apply this to God because God is holy, but the rest of us are aspiring to find holiness. What is holiness? Well, holiness is almost like if you have a category over here 
and you have another category over there. And to be holy means you're moved from a category to a different category. So if we're doing laundry, the act of being holy would be to take a really dirty t-shirt with all this mess on it, and if you would turn it into holy, you'd move it from the dirty bin to the clean bin, and now you're in a whole different place, a place where there's no mud and there's no ketchup stains, you didn't dribble your spaghetti or splash your coffee. It, nothing's dirty over there. Okay? To be in a different category apart from the dirty clothes, to be the clean clothes, you need to have been set apart in a, new, uh, in a new bin. And that's what the Savior God did to you when he brought you to know Jesus. It's as if he put you in a different bin, not a dirty laundry kind of person, but a clean heart kind of person. Uh, when he did that, you might say, he holyized you, which is a made up word, so we won't call it that. You could also say, use the old, old word, he hallowed you, which means to imbue you with, uh, with holy qualities, but that kind of sounds like being hollowed out, which is really negative. Uh, another old word was to be sainted, but there's so many different understandings in different church groups about what saints are and why we care about saints that I'm not going to use any of those words. We'll use a word that Paul brought up in Thessalonians. We're going to talk about God doing the act of sanctifying you. To sanctify is to put you in a new category. Now sometimes Christians use this in the best move that God ever did for our world, which is when he said, because of Christ, I declare you forgiven and therefore you're not stuck in death and therefore you're not stuck in guilt because all those you know Jesus by faith are not dead but alive, not dark but light, not damned but saved, not guilty but forgiven. So that's generally the act of sanctification where God in just a big way changes your story. There's another setting apart that's part of the Christian life. And this isn't just a big story of what Jesus did for you. It's how Jesus now becomes a part of you. Or rather, you become a part of him. You become an extension of Christ. And the heart of Christ, which was committed to the will of the Father, sacrificial for the well-being of his neighbors, had integrity and virtue. It's like he's a branch and you are now a vine that starts to grow off of it. And what Jesus is, you now begin to be as well. In today's message, you might see that the top meaning is the gospel, and the bottom meaning is the law as a guide for our lives. Here's what it looks like to live as a follower of Christ. And using my little pictures, of course the word sanctify would mean when you as a forgiven follower of Jesus decide you're going to shape your thoughts or your behaviors or your body or your words in one of these two directions. Either you're going to follow your airplane heart or you're going to follow your submarine heart. And the job of an airplane is to soar and the job of a submarine is to sink. And Jesus says, think like an airplane. Live holy. Live highly. Aim higher. So, we'll do our best to have fewer and fewer submarine moments because we want to be part of a more noble story. Live holy, live highly. Living highly is similar to just always doing our best to aspire to the moral high ground. Now I don't mean this in a petty sense that sometimes shows up in arguments. Like if you know you're right and the other person is wrong, you can, you can kind of prove you're right and and say, ha, 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 see, I told you so. Uh, I was right all along. We're not really only just talking about winning arguments. We're aspiring to, to a different way of thinking that's related to our awareness of what I'll call the line. I even trademarked it here, but the line is this sense of the things I better not do because if I get busted for them, I'm going to take so much heat, I'm going to get in so much trouble, it will definitely wreck my life, and I don't want what that brings. And everybody has a line somewhere in your life. 
There's something that you probably don't want to happen to you and if you get a sense that that thing is getting too close, then you're going to try to avoid it. The line. Now a submarine heart, in other words, a person whose mind isn't aspiring to live holy, live highly, but is kind of just following the instinct of what they naturally do, tends to go down. And the submarine plays a risky game. I'm going to change the metaphor now and give him a little hand and a pickaxe because uh, we'll switch from talking about a submarine going under the water to a miner going under the ground. I read a short story from a Western, uh, a collection of Western stories when I was a kid about this miner uh, out west who discovered a rich vein of gold, but it was in a really treacherous area. And every new inch that he took out of the earth to get gold, the likelihood of it caving in on him and burying him increased. So he had to consider the payoff. How deep can I go? How much can I extract from this vein before I hit the point where, oh, I guess that was a little too far. And that is the line. The line is playing this game that says, how much can I get away with before I am in trouble? Kids know how to play this game with moms and dads. Yeah, you can kind of figure out how sassy you can get before you get the benefits of being too sassy. And that's a submarine thought. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount taught about practical areas of life that are hard to get right all the time. None of us really ever do, but we aspire to them. And he talked about people who had a certain line and they didn't think they were in trouble really. No danger until you would cross that line. So the first one was the line related to the well-being of someone else's physical health and safety. And he said, you guys have heard, it's been said for a long time now, even going back to Moses, the Ten Commandments, don't murder or else you get in trouble. Right? You'll be subject to judgment if you kill somebody. But what did Jesus say? He said, the ways of God are to live holy and live higher. He said, a follower of Jesus won't be content with just saying, hopefully I won't kill anybody today. But Jesus said, unless a person is able to put away hate, the instinct to be cruel to another person, they are guilty of the same wrong that led to the action of hate. What he's doing is he's showing that there's no moral distinction in, in the standards of God between mind and muscle. And in this world with mom and dad, it makes a difference if I think the thing or if I say the thing. And if I think it but don't say it, they can't bust me for it. Right? So there's a difference between mind and muscle but in the ways of God who reads our minds like they were spoken word, mind and muscle are the same because they all come from the identity of who am I and what do I think is worth doing in this life. This is a high standard, right? Don't just avoid killing people, but avoid e even this desire to make somebody pay. He talked about a num numerous areas. One of them was uh, he, he reached back into their culture in the Aramaic language and said, uh, basically it's about libel or, or public defamation. If you really intentionally go out there in the public square and you're trying to tear down the reputation of somebody else, if you make their name as good as mud and you just, Raha! What an idiot! You get in trouble for public defamation. But I say, even if you just mutter, you fool. Comes from the same place because there's no difference between the mind and the mouth, the mind and the muscle. It's all moral. How many times in my life do I just think, you are such a stupid idiot? Never any of you. God bless me. In theory, but... You know, just think about that. How many times 
the action of that person, what they say, what they did, you just like, you are so dense. And we just feel like throwing this, this adjective at them which makes them as small as their actions prove them to be, as dumb as their actions prove them to be. It's on our tongue. And Jesus said, if you even just reach out and say to someone, you are the biggest idiot. You are in danger of, do you remember what he said? You're in danger of hell fire. Why is he doing this? He's, He's teaching us that if we play the game of that submarine who got a pickaxe and tried to go become a miner and get as close to the gold before the tunnel caved in, it's a losing game. We do not want to say, where's the line and I'm okay as long as I don't cross it. But even as we start moving toward it, the battle is lost. It's the job of a submarine heart to sink. It's the job of a Christ-like heart to soar. He fills in other uh, relationship issues. Some of them have to do with a little faith community. You know, in church, we're on your best behavior. I don't usually do most of my swearing in church. Right? Not too many, not too many acts of abuse or fistfights here in church. We save that for somewhere else. Did you hear what Jesus said? He said, if you're all getting together to go to church because church is where you get along with God and He gets along with you and we get along with each other, but you know, at home you don't get along skip church because if you truly care about reconciling people who are at war or in conflict we don't talk this stuff we don't fake this stuff we're not acting this stuff let's do this stuff so the line isn't just be good on your best behavior when you're close to the pastor or the church or God himself but when you're next to your spouse your neighbor your children, your boss, out of church mercy and graciousness is the same thing as in church. We talked about marital problems of different kinds, sexual problems. You know you crossed a line when David took somebody else's woman as his own, even though she was a wife, not his, and she became pregnant and now the stakes are higher. Because he crossed the line, right? But what did Jesus say? What if he hadn't impregnated her? What if he hadn't invited her over? What Jesus said, you've got to think higher. You've got to get above even this private imaginary fantasy world. Anyone who even looks at a woman lustfully and lets a scene go unrestrained in their mind is, is guilty of the same thing of actually David and Bathsheba. So he gave you this advice. Find the cause of the problem and then saw it off. Some of you have a table saw or a band saw or a chainsaw. So next week we can do that. If any of you did some shoplifting or had some sexual sins or maybe looked at something you shouldn't or read something you shouldn't, uh, we'll make a line over here. We'll take hands and there we'll take personal body parts and there we'll take eyes that watch the wrong things. And we'll just start carving away at all the naughty parts of each other until we get to... Where do we get to? We get to our core. And it's our core that's the problem, right? In Jesus' day, people thought, you're kind of okay on the inside and you're corrupted from outside. What did Jesus say? It's out of the heart that all these problems rise and grow. So if we're going to start chopping things off and amputating, you actually need to start from the inside out. And that's why his calling to Christians is not just to try to find some line over there where if I do bad enough, then I cross it. But to work on what are the things I, I guard and value in my heart and thought life. And this is really difficult because even those who know Christ still have leftovers. Like if you imagine having a, a wonderful uh, f- refrigerator with fresh fruit 
fruit and food in, but then in the back there's a leftover from uh, four weeks ago and you don't want to open it because it smells so it just sits there. We all have some leftovers in our corner. The sin nature hangs on to us. And that's why we fight for good and try to overcome bad and we're always arm wrestling ourselves like a plane that's trying to gain altitude even though we're in turbulence. But we always have Jesus who says no matter where you come from, I'm here to give you a new start. And that's why every week we start with confession and forgiveness to reassure you you can have a new beginning. We'll be washed again. That's what baptism signifies, means for us, right? Christ Jesus loved the church. That's you. And gave himself up for you to make your holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Why? to present her, you, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So if you had a not in church, but after church argument, that's why we have Jesus. If you had not actually adultery, but problem with pornography, or just the brain goes where it shouldn't, that's why we have Jesus. If your mouth knows the bad words and sometimes they escape, well, that's why we have Jesus. If your mom or dad ever had to discipline you, you're not holy. But that's why we have Jesus. If you know a jerk who is always making you think, what an idiot, so that you've earned hellfire again and again according to God's standards, well, that's why we have Jesus. Because Jesus, in baptism, which connects us to the cross, makes us holy and clean again. So we remember that. This is the bin we're in. This is the story we're a part of. We've been saved by Jesus and now let's be extension of Jesus. Sometimes Christians might be in their their pattern for a long time and maybe you haven't been challenged for a while or maybe you feel like you've got your faith life mastered. Maybe you feel as an airplane that you've about reached cruising level and there's nothing left to aspire to. Well, here's a few ways that if if you want to really show that you belong to Christ. If you love what he loves and want to live holy, live higher, try this one. I'm not sure how mature or what level you are as a Christian, but I know where I am and I haven't mastered this yet. Can you believe it? Like, this is a tiny portion of one of the commandments, do everything without complaining or arguing. What if I could win that Win that battle in my thought life where instead of finding all the problems and all the reason to complain, I would just have gratitude and always be looking to to find peace. What if I could be that? Well, I'm not yet, but I pray that I'd have a heart that is an airplane heart and I'm reaching for it. So when you have the opportunity, maybe you might this week, to complain or argue, live holy, live highly, If you have an opportunity to find a hookup after the bar, maybe give more thought to the hookup or even to the bar before it. Snide comment in person and type on the internet. Even in your mind, mute it. Somebody next to you has put your nose in it and now you have a chance to put their nose in it. Live holy, live higher. Live holy, live highly. I'm going to end just with an acknowledgement that this little crazy picture I'll use to represent me and my adolescent years. And I don't know how your adolescent years were. Maybe they were amazingly awesome. For me, they were, I was gangly. I had a lot of acne. And one year, your hormones start getting to your throat and your voice cracks and you feel silly just because sometimes you talk in a little kid voice and then sometimes you talk in a grown-up man voice and everything is changing and growing and it took a long time to get out of the gangly acne of voice cracking insecurity of adolescence. I I don't know what it was like for you, but it's a hard time. Thankfully, we don't stay there forever. So that's not my self-image anymore. Some of these things I grew out of, some I overcame, some I just learned to be comfortable with. I have a different self-image. I'm not an adolescent. Now I'm over the hill. But I'm closer to heaven. And in Christ, 
That's what God is doing for you. So if you ever feel frustrated at yourself and you think, when can I become a real Christian? When can I like, finally kick this bad habit or this addiction or this pattern or this guilt? We're living on this earth in our adolescent years. And that means sometimes it will be awesome and other times it will be ugly. But in Christ, he reaches down and he says, I give you your own halo because I died for you. I've been, uh, you were baptized into my name and therefore you're in the new holy category. So make that your aspiration even if you don't, haven't mastered it yet. There might be a few clouds yet that you want to climb through. There may be some altitude that you want to gain. So I pray today that God would give you a little bit more, uh, more of an ascent in the areas of your life that are most frustrating or in most need of growth. So we'll wrap it up with this prayer, we pray. Heavenly Father, you look into us. Before a word is on our, t- our tongues, you know it completely. Uh, there's details about ourselves that are hidden. I don't know how many hairs are on my head, but you've got them numbered. Sometimes our inner lives are just a chaotic mess, and yet you give us the gift of the Holy Spirit to live in us and make us a temple of, um, of you yourself as our divine Savior, God. Today, I pray for the friends in this room, for those who are, uh, have been for a long time struggling with a pet sin. First of all, release us from guilt. Uh, that's why we have Jesus. That's why we have forgiveness. And one day we'll be free from it. But help us to gain ground to be more solid, more virtuous, more patient, have more integrity because that's what we love and that's who you called us to be. For those who are being worn down by the struggles of this life, feeling stuck in this adolescent stage, help us to remember that with your help we will persevere and make it to the day of restoration. Lord, help us to have that balance of living both in peace that comes from sins forgiven and a joy that lifts our souls to heaven. We heard you say, come to me for you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And we found that. And now we hear you when you say, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. Help us to be part of the good story that you've begun that will be completed in, in glory in heaven one day. Keep us safe until we make that final um, step into our heavenly home through Jesus, our Savior. In his name, we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, be at peace. Live in harmony with each other and serve the Lord with gladness. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Remember this one? Let's bring it back one more time. Prayer for guidance as we live, live holy, live high. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
I lowered it a bit, and I'm going to bring it right back up. And just... Okay. La, la, la. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. Let the fiery cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, be thou still my Thank you.